Amen. Great singing. Thanks, praise team. Thanks for worshiping together. Isn't it awesome to be in the house of the Lord? Romans chapter 3, if you turn your Bibles there with me, Romans chapter 3, I need to uh, confess and apologize. I know some of you are going to be like, don't apologize for preaching the word. I'm not apologizing for preaching the word. Here's what I think happened last week. I saw Judy Varga. She walked in today with this really nice, like, rhubarb cherry pie or strawberry rhubarb. It looked awesome. So what I did last week is I took that pie and I put it all in front of you and I said, eat it all right now. And some of you are like, all right. And so what I want to do today is I'm going to back up a little bit, all right. We're not going to redo chapter two. I think I killed that horse. Um. Not that I killed a horse, but we're going to slow down a little bit, all right? And we're going to do Romans chapter 3, and we're going to do the first eight verses. So I'm not even going to give you a piece of the pie today. I'm going to give you a little spoonful of the pie, okay? Because I want you to take it, and I want you to chew on it, and I want you to just live that out, okay, this week. And so last week, I hope you got it. If you didn't get it, you can go online and listen to it again, and, uh, and, and there's a lot of meat there. Paul's writings are not simple and easy, okay? It, it's interesting, if you look in Peter's, uh, uh, what he writes, uh, Peter even expounds and he says that what Paul writes is hard and difficult, and so we're digging into an epistle that that really is deep, and yet I don't want to lose you. I don't want you to, to get glossy-eyed on me. I want to dig in, and I want us to be able to understand the text and what that means for us as we live it out, okay? And so Romans chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, if you would, and you're willing and able, would you stand with me, and we'll read this text together. Um, you only have eight verses to stand for, so you're, you should be good here, all right? Romans chapter 3. Verses 1 through 8. Then what advantage has a Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though every one were a liar, as it is written that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? For through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory. Why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of it. And I pray that you would come alive in our minds and our hearts today so that we may not just be hearers of your word, that we would be doers, so we would live it out. Lord, we need your help in order for that to happen. May your spirit move in our minds and our hearts in a very rich and real way this morning. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. So today we look at this uh, passage and we're going to walk through, and I've entitled today, Religion or Grace. Religion or grace, and there's seven questions that we see in this in these eight verses, um, and we're going to just kind of walk through them uh, a little bit at a time. So, Paul writes, and he says, "Then, is there any value of being a Jew?" He writes this after chapter two. Remember, chapter two, he's just slammed the Jew. Not because they're Jewish, but he has slammed them because they think they're better than the people in chapter 1. Those Gentile people who are such pagans and living this adulterous life that are without excuse because God has revealed himself to them, yet they turned against him and rejected him. 
chapter 2, here are the Jews who judge these people. The problem not, isn't necessarily that they're judging them. The problem is they are not to judge them, but that they're doing the exact same thing as they're condemning the Gentiles of doing. And so Paul writes this hypothetical question, this argument in chapter 3, verse 1. Well, if we are Jews, then what advantage is that? What advantage, what value is it that we are Jews? And then he asks the second question, or circumcision. What profit is circumcision? Why do we do this act of obedience if it really doesn't profit us in anything? And so the answer is this in verse 2. It has much value. These things have great value, or as in the text, it profits much in every way. And he writes this. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Ultimately, Paul's ar argument of what value is it to be Jewish and to do this act of circumcision. And his response is, there's great value. And for one, I'm just going to give you one. One is the fact that God entrusted his word, the oracles of God, to the Jews. God gave the Jews his word. He gave the Jews the law. He gave the Jews this, this not only the word, but the vision of this grace that God is showing to them. Because from these oracles will come to the whole world grace. Ultimately, from the oracles of God, the whole world would receive the invitation to come to him. Now think about it. Again, we see throughout the Old Testament, it's not just the Jews, but sprinkled in are Gentiles who will follow the Lord Yahweh too. The, the display of the Jewish people was God's chosen people to display for the world that God was real and that he had relations with mankind. He wanted that. He desired that. And so the Jews were set apart and distinct. They were special because they had the oracles, the word of God, that God gave them and entrusted to them. So what profit is being a Jew? God spoke to you. God set you apart. Now, verse 3. What if some were unfaithful? Or to put it this way, what about those who didn't believe? What about the unfaithful Jew? And he asks this, does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? Meaning, does their unbelief, their unfaithfulness, wipe out or invalidate, nullify God's faithfulness? Very simply put this way, since the Jews didn't keep their end of the covenant, does that prevent God from saving the world? What's Paul's response? By no means. No way. Anytime you see that, you can put no way in bright, flashy letters and exclamation marks, right? Like it's like, no, 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 no. Like, no way. It's a very bold statement. Like, okay, because the Jews were unfaithful, because you're telling us we weren't doing what's right, does that mean... That God's not going to keep his end because we didn't keep our end. No way. And he says this statement. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar. Meaning this. Even though man is a sinner, God is always true. Meaning he's true to his word. And then he uses this passage from Psalm 51 verse 4. 
And he says that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. He takes and writes the Greek Septuagint, not the Hebrew, but this Greek translation of the Hebrew text, and he presents it to, again, uh, his audience in that way. They would know Greek better than they would have known Hebrew. And so as he's writing this, he uses the last phrase of chapter 51, verse 4. But in the context, let's go back to the context of this verse. David has written this psalm, Psalm 51, as he has sinned against God with Bathsheba. Not only did he take Bathsheba as his own wife and lay with her, he also had her husband killed on the front line when he didn't do what he wanted him to do. He tried to manipulate the circumstances so that he brought him home off the front line of the war, wanted him to sleep with his wife so that it could be excused why she was pregnant. He would not have none of that. And so he sent him back to the front line with orders that he would march forward and the rest of the army would retreat, which would surely lead to his death, which it did. So David not only slept with another man's woman, he committed murder. David writes in Psalm 51, verse 4, Against you and you only have I sinned, and I've done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Paul is saying, yes, we sin, but that doesn't take away the fact that God has the right to judge. That doesn't nullify the fact, as we see here, that David writes, I have done evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words. You are right, and I am wrong, and I'm standing here before you admitting that I have done wrong because you are always right. You don't change the goalposts. What you say is who you are. And you have the right to judge because you're always right. This argument, the unfaithfulness of the Jews, does it serve to show the faithfulness of God? Yes, God is faithful. But, verse 5, but if our unrighteousness I love how Paul throws himself now in there, right, as a fellow Jew. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Again, hypothetically questioning. He's almost like he's got another friend over here. He's asking these questions for a friend, right? But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? Chuck Swindoll says this, explaining this passage. Because God made these moral demands, knowing humanity would fail, does that make his wrath unjustified? Were we doomed to fail from the very beginning? Do you know that defining what is right and what is wrong is an act of grace. Because it confronts us and it makes us look and to say, what is the source of right? Who tells us? Who defines it? Who makes it right? The argument here is, well, because you knew we were going to fail... You don't have any right to judge us. Well, that's not good logic. Because, again, there's a universal belief at this time. All Jews believe that God was the judge. Okay? God will judge the world. Here's a couple texts that prove that. Genesis 18.25. Psalm 96.13. 
Isaiah 66, 16, and Joel 3, 12. There's a universal belief that, okay, God is the judge. Well, if God is the judge, but he doesn't have the right to judge because he must have done something wrong to trap us. He knew that we were going to be sinners and we were going to fall short. Then he doesn't have any right to be the judge. Well, is God perfect and right and true? Paul's already defined that and said, yes, even if every man lies, God is always true. So if his standard is right and true, then he has the right to be the judge. Remember, go back to the last chapter. They don't have the right to judge because they're doing what is wrong. God has the right to judge because he is always right. He's always just. And just because he made a covenant with his people, knowing that they were going to fail, doesn't make him not capable or not right to be able to judge people. He gave the standard to show people, ultimately, that they weren't able to keep it and that he was able to judge them, not based upon their works, but based upon a belief, based upon a faith. So, Paul says this statement again, verse 6, by no means. No way, verse 6. For then how could God judge the world? If God is judge, what is his character? Is he just? This idea, if you walk back, the end of verse 5, kind of in parentheses in your text, it says, I speak in a human way. This is a notion, one commentator says it this way, this is the notion that unrighteous conduct could ever serve to enhance the righteous character of God is strictly a human argument. God uses all things for his glory, but God will not use evil and does not do evil. He will not use evil people to ultimately show his righteousness in the fact of manipulating and coercing them. No, there's a devil that lies and steals and cheats and ultimately desires to destroy every person on the face of this earth. Do you know that that's the enemy? And he desires to destroy you. God's purpose isn't to destroy you. God's purpose is to lay out this plan of what righteousness is. What is right and what is wrong. And he has every right to define that. And in fact, that's not being a legalist. That's not wrong of him. In fact, that shows his character and it shows his grace. Verse 6, by no means, for then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? So if I lie, God's truth are in opposition, then how can God condemn me? Because God is true. <laughs> God is just. How could God condemn you? Because he can't stand anything that is unrighteous or unfaithful. Verse 8. Why and why not do evil that good may come? Again, these last two arguments have no hypothetical answer. I mean, they, they have an answer, but there's no real answer to them. And this last is like, okay, let's just keep doing bad so that good may come from it. That's the argument. Okay, if God is right to set up the standard of what's right and wrong, he's the righteous judge because he always does what's right. And he made a covenant with us, showing us what's right and wrong, desiring for us to do what's right, but we chose what's wrong and that's against God, but he knew that we were going to do wrong, even though that shows his righteousness and our unrighteousness. Maybe we should just keep doing bad so that God can keep showing off. Good argument, right? Let's just sin 
that grace may abound. Paul's going to get to that in a little bit. Here in the beginning, it's about this Jew specifically. Should we just do whatever we want to do, believing that God's going to manipulate it to show his righteousness? That's a horrible way of living and thinking. And that's why Paul says, I'm talking about in human terms. This is the way man thinks, not the way God thinks. This is not God's intention for us. Because the truth is, sin is destructive. Paul even says, some charge us with this saying, and it's not true. This is not what we've said. But these people that live this way, that think that doing bad so that it shows God's righteousness, they get their condemnation, he says. They deserve what's coming to them. Chuck Swindoll says in his commentary here, there are no victimless sins. Every choice to do wrong harms someone. If not right away, inevitably. And if not directly, indirectly. So let's think about this. As Paul wrote from the beginning here, what his purpose is. It's the gospel. And we've talked about the gospel. And let's again redefine it as Paul has written for us here. And the first three things I want to show you here is ultimately what the gospel is not. What Paul is helping the Jew to realize is ultimately first is that the gospel is not human controlled. The gospel is not humanly controllable. Religion is. Religion is all about us doing what man has said to do. You've got to keep this and you've got to do this and you've got to walk down the aisle in this way and you have to wear this and you have to speak this and you have to appear in this way and you have to pray this. Not all of that's bad, but religion has these guidelines that say you have to control yourself in this way. It's the man's way of controlling what happens. Ultimately, the gospel message, what Paul's making an underlying argument for, and he'll continue to expand, is that the gospel is not humanly controlled. Number two, it's not doing to maintain a standing. You're not doing these things in order to maintain your standing. You don't have circumcision in order to maintain you being a Jew. That doesn't get you in right standing with God, ultimately, he's saying. But religion does do that. Religion says you must do this in order for God to hear you. You must accomplish this in order to be accepted by God. That's religion. That's not the gospel. That's not grace. Are you doing to continue to try to maintain your standing with God? Stop it. Number three, the gospel is not ineffective. The gospel is not ineffective. Sometimes we walk around on the face of this earth thinking that the gospel is ineffective. No, you know what's wrong and what's ineffective? Religion. Religion is ineffective. Keeping the law is ineffective. You can't do it, you always fail. Well, if God knew we were going to fail, does he have the right to be my judge? Yes, he does. Because he's perfect and he's right. So what is the gospel? If the gospel is not these three things, not humanly controlled, it doesn't maintain my standing with God, nor is it effective, what is the gospel? Paul's writing this and laying this out. Ultimately, the, the gospel is based solely on God's unmerited favor. The gospel is not based upon works. You can't do enough to earn God's favor. You continue to fall short over and over again. You come up with these arguments. 
thinking that you, being a Jew, have this right standing with God. No, you can be right with God based on his unmerited favor, his grace. So the gospel is based solely upon God's unmerited favor, not your keeping anything. Number two, the gospel is the means by which we can enjoy a personal relationship with God. The gospel is the means by which we can enjoy a personal relationship with God. You may have heard me say this. We live our lives not in a religion. We live our lives based on a relationship. That relationship is based on Christ and what Jesus has done for us. The gospel is that message. The gospel is what we see in chapter 1 that Paul says, I'm not ashamed. I want to display this. I want to communicate this. I want you to clearly understand what this is all about as you continue to live your lives. The rest of the world has rejected it. They're without excuse. And even you Jews who think you're religious, you judge them, but you're doing the same thing. And the truth is, God has set you apart distinctly. He gave you the oracles, the words of God himself. And yet you sit here arguing about this nonsense that God is not worthy or just enough because you sin and you choose not to listen to his oracles. You choose not to accept his grace. Instead, you're living life by a religion, keeping these standards. The gospel says, no, you can't ever do enough. The gospel says it's by grace through faith. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's salvation. Have you experienced that today? Are you saved? You say, like, well, saved from what? I didn't know I had a problem. You have a problem. You have a sin problem. You were born in sin. All right? You can blame it on your parents, but truth is, you've made bad choices too, all right? And you have that sin problem that was given to you, is passed down from Adam and Eve in the garden, and it's passed to you and me. We are born with that sin condition, and we need saved from eternity and hell, the punishment that we deserve because we are not in right standing with the creator, perfect God. And because of that, we need saved from his wrath. And the truth is, he provided a way. That way is through his son, Jesus, to believe that Jesus paid our price, that he took on his shoulders, on himself, his arm-stretched arms, the full wrath of God for us. An amazing gift that we're called to believe. And if you believe that, you are his child. You have been saved and it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You can't do it. You can't fix yourself. You can't give enough of yourself. You can't do enough. That's why it's a gift. God extends his hand with this gift in it, and it's yours to receive. So if you haven't trusted in Jesus today, today you can pray and ask God to be your savior, to forgive you of your sin and to come and be your God, the one that you trust in. Lastly, the gospel is this. The gospel is powerfully shown through our works. The gospel is powerfully shown through our works. See, our works should display God's grace. Now, remember what the gospel is not. The gospel isn't doing good works in order to maintain a standing. In order to maintain this rightness with God. No, our works display this great message of grace. The Jews missed it. That's what Paul is getting to the heart of, and he will continue to expand it in our next text that we'll see next week. The gospel message should produce in each of us a powerful message. Your works should display 
the beauty of grace. Not that you do them trying to earn God's love. God loves you as much as he does today, as he will tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day. God loves you that same amount, and it doesn't matter what you do. Well, should we do bad so that God will be more glorified? No, 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 no. Why? Because there are dear consequences, dire consequences to sin. Because it's in total opposition of God. So don't go that route. Thinking that God will be more glorified if I do wrong. No, God is most glorified when we do his good works. When we display for a world this grace that we've been given. We get things mixed up. We think that I've got to do all these things and then I'm okay with God. Here's a simple question. Do you have something wrong that happened this week? Anything bad that happened? I won't ask for you to say it out loud, but, you know, like tire blown or something, something bad. Did you for a minute think in that second or two, hmm, maybe God did this because I did this or I thought this. That's basing our salvation and our thinking is geared around what I do. Now, does God discipline us to get us back on track? No doubt. But we shouldn't walk around fearing God because the gospel tells us my works get to display his glory in this great message of I don't have to keep working to maintain my relationship with him. So when bad things happen, you can believe that he's in charge and that it's for your good. We're going to see that in a little bit. I feel like I'm giving you all the rest of the book. But can you see how Paul is continuing to build upon this? And it comes back to the center of the gospel. What it is not. They couldn't understand because they were stuck in this rut and this thinking that it was religion. Don't go down that road. It's about a relationship. And we get to show that. And you should and I should display it through our good works. Not in order to get to heaven. We display it because there's a lost world going to hell and they need heaven. That's why we get to live our lives. Displaying the power of the gospel. Will you pray with me, Lord? We thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of it. Lord, help us not to live a life of religion. Lord, help us to live a life of a relationship. Thank you, God, that you do define what's right and wrong. That's an act of grace for us. And we don't have to wonder what, what we should do. But you clearly tell us. You've defined for us how we can walk with you. On a daily basis to continue that fellowship. And yet we know that sin does at times prohibit our fellowship. It doesn't change our relationship with you, Lord. You're still our father and we're still your children. But sin does hamper our fellowship with you. Lord, you desire to let your gospel be shown through us. And often, Lord, we get in the way of that because we want to live life the way we want to. Help us to surrender our thoughts, our hearts, our bodies to living according to the gospel. The gospel that drives us. The gospel that helps us to see that we live today because of your unmerited favor. The gospel that drives us to that personal relationship that we get to enjoy every day. That drives us to your word so that we may hear your heart. So that we may live faithfully with you. The gospel that drives us to listen to your spirit that resides in us. To listen to this still small voice 
so that we may walk and be effective, powerfully displaying through our works your grace. We don't deserve it, Lord, and yet you've given it to us. May we not be ineffective. May we not come up with these arguments of the things that we have to do in order to be right in your standing. Thank you that Jesus took the full wrath, the perfect full wrath that you had, that we deserved, and he took it upon the cross for us. Help us to live obediently. Help us to live faithfully so that the gospel would be effective in spite of ourselves. We pray this in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. In just a moment, I'm going to dismiss you. I just want to encourage you, if you would, stay and have lunch with us. Our ladies have worked hard and put some things together, and I know there's one, at least one dessert that's going to be available. And uh, raspberry, or not raspberry, it's a rhubarb strawberry pie that uh, sounds really delicious. After we eat for a little while, then we'll have a brief business meeting, and, uh, and our, our leadership will lead that time together, and we'll give you more information. I just want to encourage you, as we look um, down the road at the calendar here, there are some larger things that we, that we are working towards, and we need each of your help. First, I want to ask you if you would pray. I believe, I believe things are successful or unsuccessful upon the prayers of his people. And I believe we want to be successful. We want to do what God desires through the carnival, through vacation Bible school, through other events. But we need to be people who pray and ask for God's guidance, God's direction, and that we would be obedient. So would you pray that God would allow us to be agents for him uh, through the carnival and through VBS and through some other things that are coming really, really quickly on our calendar. Number two, I want to encourage you that you would give up your time. Not only time praying, but time serving. There's opportunities for all of you to serve. It isn't our job as Pastor David and Pastor Ed and Pastor Aaron to do the work of the ministry. No, the Bible says that we train and teach you to do the work of the ministry. Okay. And so we do it together. And so we need your help and assistance that we would serve together. And, uh, and so we need your assistance. So would you consider, prayerfully consider, taking part and signing up for the carnival and signing up for some other events that we have coming up? That's not to guilt you into it. It's just to say, we're a church family. Let's serve together. Let's worship together. Let's keep continuing to be faithful together. And so... I want to pray for this morning's or this afternoon's lunch. So if you would, why don't you stand with me and we'll pray for God's blessing. That way, when I dismiss you, as you go in, you can go ahead and start eating. And uh, you don't have to wait for me to come in and bless the food. So let's pray. Lord, we again thank you and praise you for the opportunity to come and worship today. Lord, what joy it was to lift up uh, your glory, your name to sing a thousand hallelujahs. Lord, thank you for this group of people that we can worship together. And now as we enter and we eat together, we break bread not only in communion, but now we get to eat together. Lord, may you bless our fellowship. May you bless our conversations. May they honor you. May they bring you glory and as we saw in our Logos class, may you continue to stir our hearts that we would be one, that we would be unified. And Lord, we pray for the business that we'll discuss. Lord, we want to see your gospel continue to be proclaimed in our community and around the world. And so we pray for your wisdom. We pray for your continued guidance that we would walk step in step with you. Lord, whether it's today and the voting that will, will take place, 
whether it's with the carnival that will take place on Saturday or, or, or camp with our kids going to camp this summer or vacation Bible school or scrapbooking for the ladies. There's countless ways that we can walk hand in hand with you. And I pray that you would help us to do that and that we would be unified as we do that, serving you and displaying for the world the great grace that you've shown us. So bless the food to our body, bless our conversation, bless our time and our meeting, Lord. May you be glorified through all that we say and do, not only today, but in this week ahead. May we truly live out the gospel. We pray this in the name of Jesus.